Happy Sunday, everyone. It's great to be in the presence of the Lord, and it is great to be with you. I have a horrible experience. I had a horrible experience. I've been working this job, and uh, and I and I and I went to this new location. So I was had been putting my jacket in a uh, in a room, and I didn't lock the door, so I didn't see a problem with it, and. Uh, when I came and uh, picked it up, I didn't see it. So I got mad. And I did something you shouldn't have done. I used to... Uh, I yelled at God, and I blamed him for what had happened. But then I thought about it, and I said, Well, I was the one who left the door unlocked. I was the one who put my coat in there. And uh, it does say in the Bible that God gives us um, the free, you know, the freedom to make choices. So that individual will make that choice to take that jacket. And so, and I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm a saint and I never did anything wrong. So uh, later on, I apologized to God for uh, what I had said. And I said, God, uh. Would you please touch this person's heart who took my jacket and have them return it to me? And actually, it really wasn't about the jacket. There's this beanie in there that was special to me because I had it for, what, 11 years. Oh, wow. So, uh, with that, uh, it's in the past. I hope I get the beanie back. That would be nice. But uh, I'm blessed. I'm around friends. You know, I have a place to, do, to sleep. I have a job. Uh, I'm not a great cook, but I do have money, you know, so I can buy things to eat. And, um, I hope your lives are good. And I, I really pray and I say, God, um, I'm going, I'm in that cocoon stage, but I want to get out of that cocoon stage. So I say, God, uh, uh, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because I really want to, um, I really want to change and Start caring about other people and, uh, you know, go up to witness to people and read the Bible more. And so with that, I I say um, be blessed and uh, I'll be praying for you. Amen. Are you in the Yeah, I got a Take that one. I don't know if she's going to do that. All right, everyone. Great. The one that, this might be the one that doesn't work. Here, here's another one. Everyone that's uh, great to, you didn't like the pencil I gave you? That one doesn't oh. work. Oh. Okay. So, I need to take and push this up there since I got a little higher, a uh, little taller. And Mr. David, not saying anything, brother. Yeah, no, I'm not saying anything. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for showing up. For those of us that um, are familiar with us, uh, we're in our home church gathering, and um, we're really blessed. We're studying the book of Revelation. We're studying different chapters. We're studying, sometimes we go into topical issues. Uh, but we're just doing the Word of God, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And we're talking about, I'm educating and teaching you, not giving you sermons, but teaching you so that you could be a disciple, so that you could go out and that you know the truth and aren't deceived because the real reason you're deceived there's only two reasons one is that you have like a spell cast on you or the other is you're just not informed it sounds good you don't know any better so i'm just gonna believe it because it, you know you say so um that's bad so, uh, on the screen for YouTube, uh, we have this, uh, if you have any, you know, questions, uh, you could go to my email, which is there, or YouTube channel. Uh, Facebook has an issue with this, so I'm going to not put this on Facebook, I think, for a while. 
see if that's the issue. Uh, see if they take this down on YouTube. Um, that being said, we have been kicked off of Facebook. Supposedly, this one will let us go back on. I challenged it and said, it's like, you're not. But they deleted like tons of our videos. I mean, most of their videos are, a lot are gone. They just totally removed them. Um, so we kind of should, you kind of could say, wait, well, God, cool. Why is the world persecuting us, you know? Because we're speaking the truth. But a lot of these other ministries, they're like on, they get to go because they're teaching a false doctrine. They're telling you something and not giving you the word of God to back it up. I keep moving this and of course I gotta go now and, and re-see if my face is still in there centered, which it isn't there. Okay. If it, my face comes out, that's fine. We're just going to look at my belly button or whatever. Okay, so we were in verse uh, chapter 12, doing verse 5 and 6, and we kind of gave a long introduction. I believe uh, we left off here where it says, let's look at these scriptures. Is that true? You're on. I am on Facebook. Okay, so you can continue to look at Facebook and answer any questions people might have. But that's good to know. We are on Facebook. Um, so uh, we want to look at the, the scripture through lenses. So if you're as old as I am, you could remember we used to have rose colored glasses, right? We used to have brown glasses, dark, uh, different glasses, you know, amber glasses and stuff. And there was even songs uh, said back then, like you're looking through rose colored glasses. Um, so it's all the view you look at. So the view that we're looking at in chapter 12 is this woman that is about to give birth and has given birth to a male child who most commentaries equate to being Jesus Christ, uh, we're going to look at a description that this woman is a representation or symbolic of the church, which is Israel, but the true Israel. It's not all of Israel, those that God personally withheld the gospel from so that they wouldn't hear, so they wouldn't understand, and so they wouldn't be saved. But this is for the true Israel who do hear who God has chosen and uh, have been given the opportunity to follow or reject Jesus. So in my notes, I'm saying, let's look at these scriptures with the view that this child is a type and shadow of Jesus the woman is the type and shadow of Eve, and Adam is her place of protection. So remember Adam and Eve, we talked about in creation in, in the garden, it was Adam and woman. Woman was not a gender, but a name. Okay, and when they got kicked out of the garden, uh, Adam became Eve's secure protector, right? So this woman in Revelation is goes to the wilderness for a place prepared by God to protect her. So it is a semblance of Adam protecting Eve. Eve, the mother of Jesus, did, you know, when you go all the way back, genetically speaking, of Jesus, not just Mary, okay? And Eve's child, Abel, was to bring forth the deliverer. But Satan was able to kill him through the hands of his brother, older brother, Cain. So Satan was trying to stop the prophecy that God gave that Eve would have a seed, one seed, singular, Jesus, who would be the Messiah. And so Satan tries to stop that by killing Abel, who the seed was to come through. It wasn't to come through Cain. 
but it was to come through Abel. How many know brother? No, brothers are different. You could have the same mom, same dad, same house, same upbringing, but brothers are different. One could become a mass murderer and the other could become a pastor, right? One could become a doctor, the other could become a drug addict. You, you get what I'm saying? Cain was of his father, the devil. Abel was of his father, Jesus, to say. So uh, having killed Abel before he had any offsprings who would fight against him, Satan thinks he won. So Satan kind of, why does Satan not kill Seth? Because he thinks he won. He doesn't think he has to go through it anymore. How many know or recognize that when you go to battle and you win a battle, you just don't want to go out and battle again because battling hurts. You know, it's hard. Genesis chapter 3, if I remind you, it, it, this is the prophecy I spoke of. Jesus, God is talking to Satan, the serpent, and says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's a funny that this her seed is singular. His seed is plural. Uh, it's Cain's seed. The serpent's seed is plural. It's kind of interesting. Just that little point there. However, the seed of promise was not to be of Eve's offspring, but only the one seed, Jesus, which would come through the lineage of a select few. So it didn't come through the lineage of Cain. It didn't come, obviously, through Abel because he died, but it did come through Seth. But the Word of God said Seth had many sons and daughters. The Word of God says that Adam and Eve, had, after Seth was born, had many sons and daughters. But that lineage came through that one line of Seth. All the way to Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the betrothed wife of Joseph. Uh, now, after 40 generations, the promised Messiah is the one seed born to the seed of Eve. Now, 40 generations. What, what's 40 generations? Is it 40 years? Is it 100 years? Is it 1,000 years? Is it a, a time period between a father when he has a grandchild? Is that a generation or with a child? This word generation is, is used many times to describe many things. But in most cases, it's 100 years. So in 4,000 years, the Messiah is born. This is kind of cool when we look at this and understand this. So after 40 generations, the promised Messiah is the one seed born to the seeds of Eve. You notice I put S, the seeds. So Eve has many offspring who that lineage goes through. That one tree branch, I think you would cut. Like when you do a, your ancestry, you go through one branch of a tree. And, and a tree could have multiple branches and, and spread out. But there, you could trace yourself back through one branch, right? And all the way back to the root. Okay, so this is what I mean. The one seed of Jesus is born to the seeds, the many seeds of Eve. Now this one seed, Jesus, imparts his DNA to all who would be born again. So if you're not born again, even though Jesus died and is the propitiation for not only your sins, but the whole world, you don't have his DNA in you. But those who are his, have his DNA. Let's look what some supporting scripture. Um, hopefully I got this here. 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 and 9. Whosoever abideth in him, him is Jesus, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, nor knows him. So who can abide in? His father, the devil. Who did Abel abide in? 
Jesus, okay? Who sinned? Cain, not Abel, right? Whosoever, verse 9 says, whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin. Now, this is not, as many translations say, continue to sin. It does not sin. Not one time, not even capable of sinning one time. How is that possible? Many people say, well, I just sinned this morning. Well, according to the scripture, it tells us why it's possible. It says, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So that his seed is that word in Greek is sperma. His DNA is in you. You are a new creation, so you cannot sin. But again, hey, I just had an argument with my wife. I just flipped up somebody off as I was racing to church because I was late and, I, and he made a turn in front of me. I just, I'm always sinning. I'm always doing wrong. You know, that word sin has many different meanings, guys. Just like if you open up the Webster Dictionary, remember how we used to have to do that in school? We had to open it up and write down definitions. And there could be like, some words had five different definitions, 10 different definitions, you know? Well, sin has multiple definitions, but its primary, first, most used definition is not to be a part of. When you got Jesus' DNA, you could never not be a part of God. He's inside you. You can't change that. Yes, I see a hand. So I need to interrupt you. So what you're talking about is, okay, now when I went to church, they're, they're talking about sin was, you know, oh, I did something that I shouldn't have done. Or I did something wrong. But this this term of sin is more like what, a separ separati separation from God, right? Yes. Yes, it's, it's like you cannot be separated from God. It's impossible. Uh, you are of a different, um, what is it, race yeah. than I am right. and different than he is, mm -hmm. okay? You can't change that. It don't matter what you believe, don't matter your will, you can't change it. You can't even do uh, cosmetic surgery like people are doing, whether they're confused if they're male or female. You can't do it, man. And you're proud of your, your heritage. You're proud of your heritage and should be, as I am proud of mine. But we can never change that because it's in our DNA. Now, what if we have our skin bleached? Yeah, did, did Michael Jackson look black? No, he had cosmetic surgery to his nose. He had his skin bleached. But if you took his DNA, he would have said, what kind of nationality is he? Right. Yeah. If you take my DNA and you're able to isolate this Jesus seed, you would say, he's a child of God. He's a brother of Christ. He's to be the bride of Christ. Now, the other thing is, if you make a law, uh, some of us have gone to prison here, gone to jail, been fined. Why did we do that? Because we broke the law of the land. You didn't break the law of Australia. You didn't break the law of Nicaragua, of Brazil. You broke the laws of the state of California or the United States of America, right? So if you're not under that state, such as like a handgun, you could carry a handgun in some states, right? But you can't in California. Under certain, without certain provisions, right? Well, you could go to jail for doing it in this state, but not in another state. So nobody is under the law today. Not one human being is under the Mosaic law because it's gone. It's been abolished. Back then when this was written, nobody but the Jewish people and those who have converted to Judaism were under the law. Okay? So... That meant the Aborigines did not sin. They didn't break the moral law. So we put this huge thing, well, sin is doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but who says what's right and wrong? The law. 
the people say you without no law to guide you it's up to the people this is why it's not what god's talking about he's talking about that genetic seed from adam eve cain abel all the way up to mary the mother of jesus the holy spirit impregnating mary with the god gene okay does that answer your question? Yes. Has that confused you, sir? He's at shaking his head, yes. I hope that means he just didn't hear me. Now, those who are born again keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus within them. So if you're born of God, do you want to go murder somebody? No. If you're born of God, do you want to commit adultery? If you're born of God, do you want to practice witchcraft? No. If you're born of God, do you want to have hatred? No. Actually, you could look up in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, and you could see all these works of the flesh. If you're born of God, you don't want to do them. They are works of the flesh. They are not actions that condemn you. They are what the flesh, Satan, will use to condemn you. What it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 is, and the dragon, who is Satan, will say, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. This word testimony, this testimony is they have the DNA of Christ. Jesus has proclaimed that they are mine. They have been sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. As we read in chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7, that the wrath of God cannot, will not, and has not been poured out on the earth until all those who would come to Christ have come to Christ and they're sealed on their forehead with the seal of God. And Ephesians tell us, us Christians have been sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, for the day when God calls us up for the rapture. Okay? So what this what is this testimony of Jesus? I already answered that, uh, which makes a difference be a different difference between those who keep the law and those who abide in Christ. This testimony is the blood of Jesus, his own DNA, which has been imparted to all who are his. So just because you kept the law perfectly doesn't mean you have salvation. Paul wrote and he said he kept the law perfectly. But he says people look at the law for salvation and there's none there. It's only a law of con a covenant of condemnation, of destruction. What it says in 1 John 3, 9, I already read to you, uh, is where we got Jesus' DNA imparted to us. However, the, the word I'm trying to tell you for uh, seed is, is right here. It's semen, viral, a product of his his this semen seed, children, offsprings, prodigies, etc., etc. You have the semen of God in you. You have the DNA of God in you. Okay? I know that sounds kind of weird to some, but if you take it down to DNA. I have the DNA of Christ in me. I can never not be of Christ. Hmm, could I ever lose my salvation? Hmm, kind of puts a, a conundrum on it. Well, the Bible tells us in Hebrews that it's impossible for those who have once tasted of God, the Holy Spirit and his works, that if they fall away to ever redeem them back. And a matter of fact, if they willfully sin, there's nothing left but willful condemnation that they wait for. What means is, yes, it is possible that you lose your salvation. So what does God do? 
He makes it impossible. He makes it impossible by putting his DNA in you. So now it's not up to your works. It's, uh, it's not up to what you've done. It's up to what God's done. So, ultimately, you can never lose your salvation. Once you have Christ's DNA in you, you can never do it. The question is, is when do you get Christ's DNA in you? We do run this race. Okay, so this is Jesus' testimony that I am his because I have his DNA and the Holy Spirit dwells within me. Therefore, I cannot sin, be separated from God. For those who sin belong to the devil. First John, I, again, I read 3 and 9. You belong to Satan is what it says. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever abideth in Christ sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither knows him. Whosoever is born of God do not commit sin. Whosoever is born of God do, does not commit sin. For his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Then we go all the way to uh, chapter uh, 5 of the same book. So 1 John chapter 5 verse 2, verse 10 and verse 18. By this we know, come on you can do it. By this we know that we have, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Verse 10, he that believeth in the Son of God hath the witness within himself, his DNA. He hath believed not, God hath made him a liar. He that believeth not hath made God a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave his own, his son. Verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Why did I read all these verses to you, not once, but three times, and show all the different verses? Because there's this conspiracy going out that God didn't really mean that. That the Bible didn't really say that. That it was mistranslated. And some have gone as far as to take 1 John chapter 5, verse 18 out, 17 and 18 out. Some, uh, most of the translations translate it, uh, continue to sin, then cannot sin, but continue to sin. And my first argument to anybody that does that, you're a gamer, you're a player, you go out every week, you go play with your old uh, your buddies and your old girlfriends and crowd and every Friday night you go home with a, a, a woman okay then all of a sudden you get married you find when you get married Friday night comes along you go out with the boys and you go home with a different woman you do it every Friday night four to five times a month oh but you come to Christ your wife's a Christian. She drags you to church. You, see, you believe in Jesus. You come to Christ. You ask him to forgive you of your sins. But you know you're just a man. You all sin. You all fall short. This just means he doesn't continue to sin. So you say, okay, well, you know, I've changed. I'm not as good as I uh, Perfect. No one's perfect but God. But I'm not as bad as I used to be. Honey, I used to cheat on you every Friday night. But you know what? Believe it or not, I only do it once a month now. What do you think she's going to say? <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be taken well. It's either you're all for me or you're against me. There is We don't share our bed with anybody else. God does not share you with anybody else. You either love the one and hate the other, but you cannot serve two masters at once. It is impossible for a Christian to have a desire to sin and sin. 
born again. It is impossible for a Christian. I'll say this for many people that I know and love. How far, it's impossible for a born again man to commit adultery against his wife by having an affair. I was uh, uh, ministering yesterday to a group of people going through recovery in Yuba City. And I brought this out to them, okay? That I there was a pastor I was dealing with, and we were talking, and we were bearing one another. I was, he was trying, he's coming to me for prayer, and he's saying, I just he's a pastor. He's preaching every Sunday. And he said, I just can't get rid of this uh uh uh, uh sexual immorality. Every time I go out to the job site, prostitutes come up to me and I and I fall, I fail, I give in. And he's married with children. I said to him, your problem's not that you're tempted. Your problem is you don't love your wife. Because if you loved your wife more than yourself, you wouldn't go out with these prostitutes. This is what 1 John 4, 7 and 8 means. Beloved, let us love one another. He that loveth knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. So if you can't love your wife, you don't know God. You can know about God. You can have a relationship with God. You could do signs and wonders all in the name of Christ. But when the great and fearful day of the Lord comes, many will say, including you, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out demons? Have we not performed many signs and wonders in your name? And Jesus replies back to them, get away from me. I never knew you. You never knew me. Let me get off my high horse and get back in. That's why I'm showing these scriptures. The word of God is true. You can never be separated from God. And if you really have love, you can't be hurting people. So quit trying to be good. Just be good. Just go and embrace God. Quit trying not to do bad things that you feel bad about, guilty about. Just try to get closer to God. The more you know God, the less your desire you're going to have. Oh, but then Satan comes and says, see, well, you do that. You must not have a real relationship with God. No, you're in that cocoon state. You're you're going. You're in that cocoon state, right? So while you're in that cocoon state, the old man's dying. The new man's about to be born again, recreated. You're in that transition period. But when you become a new creation, it's impossible for you to go and eat and live the way you used to. Caterpillar, uh, butterflies cannot live like a caterpillar even though they once were one. Now, this testimony makes it possible for God to never, I don't know how that, yet we missed that one, Des. This testimony makes it impossible for God to never, there should be an in there, not ever, never forsake you. Furthermore, because he dwells within you, you are empowered to be a witness of Jesus, which is different from being a witness of Jesus. This witness of Jesus is the feeling of his Holy Spirit, which empowers his witnesses to fight against the devil. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power. What, what are you going to receive? Power. He's talking to the disciples, the apostles, who have been filled with the Holy Spirit after Jesus' resurrection and, and ascension. But ye shall repeat, well, not ascension yet. He's saying this before he ascends. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Good morning. I lost my place. 
the uttermost parts of the earth is what I just said. Hello, thank you. Then we go to Mark chapter 16, verse 17. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up persecutions, and they shall and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I did print up a new one for you. Or you gave it to her? Okay. We're in Woodland. Sorry about that. I try to be funny, but I usually am not. This is another one of those times. Now, make no mistake. Once you are a Christian, a true Christian, Satan will make war against you. You ever notice that the closer you get to God, the more difficult it seems to get? The more people you got to pray for, the more problems you have? It's because once you are really a Christian, now you are at enmity with Satan, at war with Satan and his seed. So all these people in politics that are worshiping Satan and persecuting you, like Facebook taking us off for a while, wh why? Because I speak the truth, because you're a light of Christ. So it is to your advantage to be baptized in the Holy Spirit that you may be equipped to battle against the devil and his demons. Now, come on, man. We have this whole thing about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've taught it here before. I've taught about speaking in tongues. There's a real hindrance to doing that. But what is that? That's giving you like a great big machine gun, maybe a bazooka, maybe a tank, maybe a really big... Uh, 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 weapon to go fight against your adversary, you know? Uh, you don't want to go to battle with a knife. You don't want to go to a gunfight with a knife, right? You don't want to go to a, a, a tank uh, excursion where they're blowing things up and helicopters uh, bombing stuff and airplanes bombing and missile striking. You don't want to go there with some nunchucks. You know, with brass knuckles, you're not going to win. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be an effective warrior against Christ. What it says in a Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. He's going to make war with you because he's pissed off. Now, who's the remnant of the seed? Those who keep his commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. We already read and talked about that. But God, is, Satan, is going to come and fight against you. Man, if you are not being attacked by the devil, you might want to move into Christ. Hey, God, what's wrong? I thought by now you and me would be, you know, I'd be graduated from boot camp, ready to go to battle. The wilderness the woman fled to was a place prepared for her where she would be fed and protected by God through Adam. Remember, Adam became Eve's succor after her deception in the Garden of Eden. Eve's protection was crucial that she might have offsprings until the time was right for the Messiah to come. I have said this over and over again. Man is the succor of woman. That's why a woman could never be a pastor. That's why a woman could never be a teacher. That's why a woman could never have authority over a man, which all these are talking about authority, because the man is the one that is commanded by God to give up his life for the protection of, of his wife, if necessary. Men are supposed to protect their wives. Wives are not supposed to protect their men, and in most cases, cannot. Now, today we live in a society where a woman could carry a handgun and, and protect herself just as a man is carrying a handgun. Well, not every woman's married. But not every woman's married either. But every woman should be. According that that of age, 
should be because she needs a protector. But the ones that aren't, God says, this is what you got to do. You got to totally dedicate yourself to God through fasting and prayer and ministering to the apostles' feet. So if you're not going to get married and have a protection, you got to put yourself under the protection of the church leaders and be ministering to them, taking care of their every need, not sexual, but every need, just like a wife takes care. In other words, you're cooking their food, you're uh, folding their garments, you're getting their bags packed to go on their missionary journey, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm sorry, because women are in an exalted state. The world says that's a bad state. But remember how we used to, even in America, put women up on a pedestal? You know, they're on a pedestal. We die for them. We treat them like princesses. Okay, even if they, the princess doesn't think we are. Now, um, uh, this period spoken of in Revelation of 1,260 days, described in Revelation, as the time the woman spends in the wilderness may just be this period between Adam and Eve being cast out of the earth up to the silent years between the book of Malachi and Matthew, which just happens to be 35 centuries, three and a half years, if you're calling those days more than a 24-hour period of time. That's amazing. You know, there's those signs. You hold your Bible up, and, you, and and what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in your Bible? Well, it's not one single page, a blank page. It's 400 years of silence. Nothing was written. Nothing was written, and we'll and we'll bring it. We'll bring that up next week. We'll bring that up to what that really means, but. When you go between the Old and the New Testament, the book, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, there's 400 years of silence. And then when you get to <coughs> the first century where Christ preaches, you get 500 years. 35 centuries and 500 years is four, 40 centuries. Remember what? 4,000 years. This time that was foretold of the Bible. So this brings us to our conclusion. Um, now, rather than a three and a half year period for the woman's protection, the 1,260 days may be interpreted as 35 centuries which just happens to be the same amount of time from Adam's banishment from the garden to the silent age, starting after the book of Malachi, leaving only four more centuries to pass until God comes to the earth as the second Adam. Remember, Jesus is the second Adam, okay, to pay the price for his inheritance, redemption, that his house might be full. Jesus paid the price for you to be see, be free. Who are you a slave to? Sin. 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 I mean, when you become a Christian, you're a slave to Jesus. But Jesus redeemed you from sin. You belong to sin. When sin gets cast in the lake of fire, you get cast in the lake of fire. Not because of what you did, but because of who you belong to. When Jesus ascends into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and I'm sitting with him, it's not because of what I did. It's because, oh, who I'm in, what Jesus did. You see how easy it is? I'm going to be with God on the throne of God because of Jesus, not because of me. Let's see what my supporting scripture was. Luke 14, 23 says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. Jesus want a full house, and that ain't no movie. That ain't no sitcom, okay? The church 
Oh, let me see. What was the first word? Uh, my bad. Then he builds the foundation. Foundations of the church through his disciples. Any ending the 40th century BC and starting the 1st century AD. The disciples established the church. The apostles established the church. There's many churches today, right? But you know, back then, there was only one doctrine and many churches. Any other doctrine that anyone else that came and preached another gospel was to be shunned, to be, a, Paul said, to be accursed. So today, this is where the Catholic Church comes up, but the Catholic Church is wrong. Not in what they say about this, but in their practices. They say there's only one true church, and they're it. Well, there is only one true church, and it's not the Catholics. It's not the Jehovah Witnesses. It's not the Mormons, but it's those who are in Christ Jesus. It's the remnant of God. Now, this leaves only 20 centuries left to gather all his inheritance before the millennium reign begins on earth. This totals 6,000 years of the work of God to redeem his inheritance, which corresponds to the ending of the sixth day of creation spoken of in Genesis, where God says, it is good. You know, when Jesus brings in all his fold, his bride, all those that would come against the body of Christ or killed, done away with, God will say, this is good. It's all good. Now, followed by this follows by another thousand year period where he rests from his labor his labor, he's not bringing any more people to him. He's not bringing any more. He's not fighting against any more that would persecute his bride. But he rests. And how's he rest from his labor? He reigns as king of kings and lords of lords. All this to fulfill his desire for mankind to flourish as it was his original intent mentioned in the book of Genesis. Remember when God created man and woman, cows, mustangs, mosquitoes, plants, poison ivy, all the he said it was good. He quit creating anything. He didn't create anything since then. That was God's intent. You know, the word of God says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know that world is not the world system. It's not human beings. It's frogs, mosquitoes, plants, dirt. God loved the world. He wants, He loved it. He created it in the first place. He wants it to grow and strive without the influence of sin. Because remember, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. So in the millennium, where's sin going to be? Satan, where's he going to be? In the pit, right? For a thousand years. What's a thousand years? One day. Not one literal day for us, but it can be considered as one day. A thousand years to the Lord is this one day, and one day is this a thousand years. Okay. Um, now, the Jewish calendar, this is kind of neat. The Jewish calendar, as of January uh, the 20, 2024, so as of right now, is 5,748 days 84. and 84 years. 5,000, thank you. 5,784 years from creation to the end time. What's going to happen when it's six days? What's going to happen when it's 6,000 years? Then I believe the millennium is going to start. But that does not mean you and I as Christians have, what, uh, 216 days, years to do it. Because we are going to be raptured when what? When the last person whose name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life had the decision to follow God or not. And then we're going to be caught up with God. And we're going to spend time with God. 
And then Jesus, God, comes back to battle against the world. The battle against those who persecuted the saints. That's going to take time. The beast got to rise. I mean, if we are all raptured today, the temple still has to be rebuilt. There still has to be the abomination declaration. There still has to be the witnesses coming down and died. There still has to be a lot of things. There still has to be a whole bunch of nations that come together. Now, things are really rapidly coming together fast now, but it's still, it's not going to be overnight. Quite possibly going to be this war, this battle, until the end time is going to be 216 years long. Okay, so this uh, leaves a very short amount of time to seal all those who are his with his, come on, Holy Spirit. This is what we got to do to make people Christians. What it says in Revelation chapter 7, you know chapter 7 comes after chapter 6, right? Chapter 6 talks about all this destruction that's going to happen on the earth. But chapter 7 says, put, put some break, put a warning light on, and says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God on their forehead. Now we go down into Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and it says, In whom you, I'm sorry, in whom ye, I'm going to sneeze, I'm sorry. I opened the window and I said, it's like the pollen coming. In whom we also trusted after ye heard the word of truth and the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with, I should say with the Holy Spirit. It came off. I don't want to misquote it. Okay, yeah. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It was promised to us. It came. Jesus died, buried, resurrected, so that we would receive the promise, the seal of God for the day of redemption. If this is the case, which I believe it is, what does it mean? Once all those whose names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world have been given the chance to accept or reject Jesus' propitiation, the rapture can and will take place. Followed by God pouring out his wrath on the earth and those who dwell there, that the remnant of Satan might bow their knee before their destruction for worshiping demons and defiling the temple of God, which are the remnant of the woman's seed. Let's look at a couple of scriptures right here. It says in Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, and at that time, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and of things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So just because you confess that Jesus is Lord does not mean you're going to spend eternity with him. Just as we've seen the man with the story in where Joshua goes into the promised land and he goes and fights the city of A and like 20,000 or a whole bunch of people die. And he asked God, how come? And God says, because there's sin in the camp. One man took some possessions of a previous victory, buried it in his tent. And the result of that, Israel lost the next battle. Then a lot of people died because of one man's disobedience. But what does he do? He confesses that he does it. Does Joshua offer him repentance? No, they stone him. These people that will bend the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord does not mean they are not going to get thrown into the lake of fire. It just means they're finally going to confess that they're guilty. Now, Revelation 9.20 says, 
And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Even after they see the power of God, they're not going to repent of doing it. They're going to be sorry. They're going to confess Jesus is Lord, but they're not going to repent. They're still going to worship demons. Now we go to Revelation 11, verse 13, and it says, In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain men of 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory, glory to God in heaven. So they say, yeah, this is of God. There ain't no way out. He's punishing it, but suck to be us. They're not offered salvation. Okay, so then the last and final verse is in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, please do not believe that this, this, Amanda, could you let Amanda in, please? This being the temple of God is not you eating pork. It's not you drinking soda pop and putting sugar in it. It's not you being overweight. You are not destroying the temple of God. This reference is talking to those who follow Satan. Those who are the remnant of Satan's seed, that they destroy the temple of God. Do you know uh, it says that Paul was beheaded? You know, it says in Revelation that, that there's going to be a lot of people that are beheaded. Okay? That means those people kill, destroy the temple of God, who you are, because we're the temple of God. So here's the grace you could eat whatever you want, just bless it. You don't fall under this. But if anyone comes to hurt you, woe be to them. Well, how about Paul? Paul, Hi, honey. Paul had a lot of Christians killed. But what did Paul say? It's I no longer liveth, but Christ liveth in me. Why? Because I was crucified with Christ. But I still live. How do I live? I live by the faith of Christ who resurrected me from the dead. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing and twisting this around. But Paul says his old man who killed all these uh, Christians is dead, does not exist. Paul says he's a new creation in Christ. He's been made completely different, which you are too. All right, so we've moved on. We're done with that. Unless we have any other comments, let's just say goodbye to everybody. And we could start with our great meal of fellowship. See you next week, God willing. And they don't delete this after I post it.